I was in the same army, in the 4th, and we heard about Rommel. Some sergeant major said to me, there's this mad divisional commander. He just rushes forward without any cover on the left or right, and yet he's successful. And that was the Gespenster division. We only learned later on that it was Rommel. His name inspired fear and respect among the enemies of fascism. In the Third Reich, he was celebrated as if he were a popular hero. The Germans believed they would win the war as long as he was on their side. However, despite the entire nation placing the burden of the war on his shoulders, he was not a convinced Nazi. He distrusted Hitler and his ability to lead the army, something the Fuhrer would not forgive. Today, in this new episode, we will tell you everything about the unknown life of Erwin Rommel, the best general in Germany during World War II. Johannes Erwin Eugen Rommel was born on November 15, 1891, in Württemberg, in what was then the German Empire. His father had been an artillery officer and expected his son to follow the same path. But young Erwin had no desire to be a military man. Instead, he was drawn to engineering. He was fascinated by machines, to the point that as a teenager, he acquired a motorcycle, which he used to dismantle and reassemble piece by piece. However, due to family pressure, he had to abandon his passion for machinery construction and enlist in the Danzig Officer Academy. At the age of 18, although he was a brilliant student, no one could have imagined that he was destined to be one of the most important generals in German history. In 1911, he graduated with the rank of lieutenant. At the same time, he met Lucia Maria Mullen, a 17-year-old girl whom he became engaged to. Two years later, before getting married, he began an affair with Walburga Stemmer, the vendor of a fruit and vegetable stand. Without Lucia's knowledge, he had an illegitimate daughter named Gertrude. Rommel wrote letters to his lover promising to leave his fiancée, quit the military career, and start a new life with her and the newborn. However, our protagonist was pressured by his surroundings to end his relationship with Walburga and return to Lucia. He was told that his behavior was not suitable for an officer of the German Empire, and on the other hand, his lover came from a humble home so the relationship was not convenient for him. Here you can see a descendant of Walburga talking about the moment when Rommel ended their affair. Two months after his letter, when he said they would get the flat and they would stay together, two or three months later, she got another letter explaining that he couldn't marry her. The conflict was resolved discreetly and did not become a public scandal. Rommel's solution was to tell his fiancée the whole truth, including that he had an illegitimate daughter. Lucia understood and still accepted to marry him. Nevertheless, Erwin had the decency not to forget his lover and her child and continued to assist them with money. He never lost contact with them and wrote to them weekly for years. Still, while Berga never accepted that Rommel did not want to be with her, leading to a tragedy. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. In 1914, when World War I began, Lieutenant Erwin Rommel fought in the campaigns in France, Romania, and Italy. Since then, he gained notoriety in the army for his surprise attacks. On August 22nd of that year, he had his baptism of fire. On that occasion, while leading a small group of three men in Verdun, he launched an assault against a distracted French garrison. All of young Irwin's military actions followed the same pattern. Infiltrate enemy lines using heavy covering fire, advance rapidly to a position that allowed him to flank his opponents, and then open fire ruthlessly, just when they least expected it, until they surrendered, fled, or died. The successes of our protagonist led to him being awarded the Pour le Mérite, one of the highest decorations of the German Empire. In 1918, at the end of the war, he had reached the rank of captain. Two years later, Germany plunged into chaos, partly due to dissatisfaction with the defeat in the war, 
leading to the emperor's resignation and partly due to the disastrous economic situation. In this context, there were communist uprisings against the government, seeking to seize power and establish a new social regime. While many military leaders suppressed the rebellions with bloodshed, Erwin tried to pacify them through diplomacy and without causing unnecessary massacres. It is interesting to compare Rommel's trajectory with that of Adolf Hitler. Both fought in World War I and experienced the suffering of the trenches. Both were anti-communists and believed in the stab-in-the-back theory, that Germany had been betrayed by Jews and socialists, and that without them they would have triumphed. However, the main difference between them was that, for Rommel, violence was not necessary to solve the problem. He believed it was possible to reach an agreement with the rebels through negotiation. As their adherence to communism was due to the economic hardships the country was going through. Needless to say, Hitler's perspective was more extreme. Rommel was convinced that once wages were restored and the population was employed under dignified conditions, the specter of a Bolshevik revolution would disappear forever. Our protagonist had a special sensitivity to detect Germany's problems and a more than peculiar personality, as this historian points out. He was an innate man of action, brimming with ideas, with the flexibility of a fox. But he was not a fox in personality terms at all. In 1928, Erwin received a devastating blow. He learned that his ex-lover, Walburga Stemmer, had died. Publicly, her family claimed she died of pneumonia, although she had actually committed <laughs> The woman had never overcome Rommel leaving her. Consumed by guilt and guided by his strict sense of honor, the officer took Gertrude, the fruit of his affair, to live with him and his wife, Lucia. He never admitted to his friends and family that the 15-year-old girl was his illegitimate daughter. On the contrary, he chose to refer to her as his niece. No one asked too many questions since the story seemed plausible. After all, so many millions of Germans had died in the war that it didn't seem strange that the teenager had become an orphan and was now cared for by a family friend whom she affectionately called uncle. However, Gertrude knew the truth of the story and in her private correspondence with Rommel, she called him father. The relationship between them was one of immense affection and in fact, she knitted him a scarf that, years later, our protagonist would wear in the North African military campaign. On the other hand, it is worth noting that, in late 1928, Erwin and Lucy had their first child, whom they named Manfred. The National Socialist Movement grew to the point where its leader came to power in January 1933. By then, Rommel held the rank of lieutenant colonel in the Wehrmacht, meaning he was a significant officer. He first met the Führer on September 30, 1934. While the dictator was conducting one of his routine troop inspections, Rommel was not a member of the Nazi party, although historians have debated extensively about his sympathies for National Socialist ideology. Below, we will see an excerpt from an interview with Manfred Erwin's son, talking about the relationship between Hitler and his father. My father and my mother were deeply impressed by the successes at home and abroad. Of course, they were fake. Hitler just printed money and pretended to be a miracle worker. But at the time, people didn't see through it. Also, Hitler gave the impression of being on the side of the military, and they liked that too. So, I can't say that in the years 1933, 34 and 35, my father understood Hitler's true nature, not at all. If that had been the case, then his behavior would not have been at all explicable. As you can see, he does not believe that in the early years of the dictatorship, Erwin was aware of the Fuhrer's true intentions. As we saw earlier, he did not view Jews favorably, but he also did not share the anti-Semitism of the Nazi leader. Nevertheless, he never did anything to defend the Jews 
and watched with disinterest and apathy as they were increasingly marginalized in society and subjected to terrible humiliations and aggressions. In any case, this was the attitude of millions of Germans. It cannot be said that Rommel's behavior was much different from that of his compatriots. In 1937, Rommel published his masterpiece Infantry Attacks, a book about military tactics in World War I that instantly became a classic. This only solidified his reputation as a military instructor, to the point that Hitler himself owned a copy of the book that he read regularly. Shortly afterward, the dictator appointed him the second commander of his personal escort battalion. It was an honorary position, and our protagonist used the free time it provided to pursue his interests in engineering. However, while he was interested in motorcycles and gliders in his youth, he was now interested in mechanics applied to the war industry, tanks, and machine guns. In September 1939, Hitler invaded Poland and World War II broke out. Rommel was promoted to the rank of general, and from this point on, he began to influence to be appointed to lead a tank unit. It is difficult to know what Rommel thought about the war. Some historians indicate that he saw the Fuhrer as an erratic leader with unclear intentions beyond unleashing a global conflict. In fact, as we will see below, his own son recounts that even in the late 1930s, Rommel did not look favorably on the possibility of a new military confrontation. My mother always said that when my father left for the Führer's headquarters in 1939, he was still saying, as long as my generation who experienced the World War are still around, you can be sure that there won't be a second. Clearly, his prediction was far from reality. In any case, Rommel eventually achieved his military goal and was promoted to general of the 7th Panzer Division, which consisted of two unknown 18 tanks, two infantry regiments, a battalion of motorcycle soldiers, an engineering battalion, and an anti-tank troops battalion. Irwin prepared them to carry out surprise attack maneuvers. That tactic had allowed him to win his first battles in World War I, and now he planned to repeat them. It was about striking with speed and force, leaving the enemy bewildered, not allowing them to regroup and dispersing their men. This was how Rommel's tanks paved the way for the Third Reich to expand into France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. In February 1941, once his mission on the continental Europe was fulfilled, Hitler and the Wehrmacht put him in charge of the campaign in North Africa, where he had to defeat the Allies and prevent them from attacking Germany from the south. It was a complicated task, as on this occasion he was not fighting on the familiar territory of the old continent, but now faced an endless desert. The climate was different, the landscape was unlike anything he knew, and the tactics to be employed had to be modified. In theory, Rommel was supposed to be subordinate to the orders of an officer of Mussolini, General Italo Gariboldi. However, in practice, Irwin completely ignored him and did what he considered necessary to defeat the English, who were the main threat on the North African front. Our protagonist's lack of respect for the Axis forces chain of command is one of the reasons why many consider him an overrated military man. After all, one of the main maxims of any army is to respect superiors, a rule that Rommel was not too interested in following. Nevertheless, Irwin became known for being one of the most ingenious generals of the entire campaign. He led nighttime or sandstorm attacks, moments when his enemies were most vulnerable achieving significant victories. His triumphs and tactical intelligence earned him the nickname Desert Fox, and his image spread far and wide throughout the West. In Germany, Minister of Propaganda Joseph Goebbels tried to turn him into a kind of popular hero. Irwin was a charismatic officer who sought to show himself alongside his troops and built the image of a leader who fought side by side with his subordinates. At the same time, the cult of the Desert Fox served to distract the Germans from the disaster that had become the Eastern Front, where the struggle against the Soviet Union was stagnating. Our protagonist's photo adorned the offices of government agencies. Rommel himself 
enjoyed popularity, and diligently posed for the photo sessions ordered by Goebbels, as recounted by this historian. Rommel would sometimes pose. If he noticed a cameraman who wanted him in profile, he would thrust forward his forceful chin and hold the pose for a few seconds to give the photographer time. His fame was so great that German radio stations broadcast battle reports where he had participated. In this way, the general public could be aware of the day-to-day -day life of their hero. It is also true that this aroused the antipathy of other Nazi leaders, as they feared that Erwin's popularity would surpass that of the Fuhrer himself. In any case, despite his overall good performance in Africa, a series of harsh defeats in 1943 led him to resign from the command of the campaign and return to Germany. Rommel maintained an important position within the Wehrmacht, although his differences with Hitler became increasingly profound. He was convinced that the war was lost and that it was necessary to reach a peace agreement with the Allies. Otherwise, Germany would be doomed to total destruction. In his letters, he implored Hitler, time and again, to consider the possibility of negotiating with his enemies, but the dictator always refused. In his mind, the conflict was an all-or-nothing gamble, and there were no options other than death or glory. This brings us to the climax of this story, which is, at the same time, one of the most mysterious moments in Rommel's life. It is known that the Desert Fox was, at least minimally, involved in the July 20th, 1944 plot when a group of German officers attempted to assassinate Hitler with a bomb. However, his role in the operation is not entirely clear. It is believed that initially, Rommel was against killing the Fuhrer, as this would unleash a civil war for control of Germany. However, he changed his mind shortly afterward when he realized that arresting and displacing him from power was impossible, as he was heavily guarded. Over the course of days, the Fuhrer's favorite general would have joined the plan to assassinate him. However, on July 17, 1944, Rommel was incapacitated by an air raid. It is possible that for this reason, Klaus von Stauffenberg was in charge of planting the bomb at Hitler's feet. Although the attack worked, Hitler barely received superficial injuries. Once the conspirators were arrested, Rommel's name surfaced almost immediately. Surprised by the turn of events, Hitler sent the Gestapo to his home, which proceeded to arrest him. For his betrayal, he was to be sentenced to death. But the great inconvenience was that Erwin was an extremely popular man. If the public discovered that he had broken his oath of loyalty, Germany's morale could collapse. Likewise, it could lead to unforeseen consequences within the army. Rommel had to disappear but discreetly without causing a national scandal. In October 1944, the Nazi dictator sent generals Wilhelm Bergdorf and Ernst Meisel to make a proposal to the Desert Fox. He could reject the accusations of treason and elevate his case to a public trial, in which case he would lose and his family would be executed. Alternatively, he could choose to take his own life. If he voluntarily ended his life, the government would declare that he died of a heart attack, give him a funeral with honors and provide a pension to his family. Seeing that he had no other options, he accepted the second choice. He informed his wife and children of his decision, said his goodbyes, and got into a car with the Fuhrer's generals, who drove to the countryside. When they were alone and far from the world, he ingested a cyanide capsule. Minutes later, Erwin Rommel lay dead, Hitler fulfilled his part of the deal, publicly announced that the Desert Fox had died honorably, declared a day of mourning, and granted him a state funeral. Next, we will hear an excerpt from the speech that was read in his name. Führer und oberste Befehlshaber der Wehrmacht hat uns hierher berufen, um Abschied zu nehmen von seinem auf dem Felde der Ehre gebliebenen Generalfeldmarschall Rommel. Mit uns steht nicht nur die deutsche Wehrmacht, sondern das ganze deutsche Volk in ehrfurchtsvollster Trauer und in tiefem Schmerz. 
an der Bahre dieses toten Helden. Darüber hinaus wird aber auch die uns feindliche Welt die Achtung einem Gegner nicht versagen können, der in Ritterlichkeit und soldatischer Größe stets das Schwert geführt hat. The true cause of his death was only known a year later, when Germany was on the verge of losing the war and Allied intelligence interrogated Erwin's family. Today, Rommel is one of the most controversial generals of the Third Reich. Some say his talent is overrated, but others point to him as a brilliant and heroic officer who made the Allies believe their days were numbered. In any case, the truth is that his name will live forever in the history books. We've reached the end of the video, and we want to ask you, do you think Rommel could have become the leader of Germany if the assassination attempt against Hitler had succeeded? Leave your answer in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe to our channel to learn about many more military events that left their mark on history.